How many of you grew up in suburbia? Yes, me too. Um, and this is the house actually I grew up in uh, when I moved here from Argentina, soon after I moved here from Argentina with my family, with my brother and my parents. Um, and it became very clear to me early on how much the car has shaped our country, the way we develop, the way we live. Um, you know, having the car allowed suburbia to happen. It allowed us to live further away from our jobs, right? It allowed us to create these new communities. There was a lot of fantastic things that happened. But this revolution, which was the automobile, also created all sorts of problems. Uh, we got sprawl, uh, we got strip malls, we got traffic. And one of the big issues, you know, we, we started to have all these problems uh, associated with suburbia. So we started consuming more and more land, degrading our environment, uh, consuming habitat. We had fiscal problems. It cost a whole lot to develop suburbia and to continue to maintain all the infrastructure that's necessary. And we had a whole lot of social isolation. Imagine if, when we first introduced the car, we had been able to have some foresight. We'd be able to take a little bit of agency, a little bit of control over what our future would be, instead of having it more or less happen to us, which is what happened. Well, we're about to hit a second revolution. And this second revolution is the self-driving car or autonomous vehicle, AV for short. And with this revolution, there's currently a whole lot of research that's happening around uh, the technology itself, how this works, and there's very little that's looking at what we call the secondary impacts. How is this new technology going to be affecting our cities, our communities, the way that we live? And that's the thing that we're interested in. How is it that this new technology is going to affect things like land use, how our cities are organized, uh, what parts of the city we live in, um, street design, neighborhood design, all these kinds of things. How many of you are just dying to get into an autonomous vehicle? You'll be able to be in there, you'll be able to get on your, car, on your phone, you can nap while the car moves. Yes, I put myself in that camp as well, very excited. Uh, how many of you are terrified to get into an autonomous vehicle? Yes, I put myself in that camp as well. Um, so maybe you've seen some of the latest news with Tesla and Uber crashes. There's reasons to be concerned. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually in both of these camps, uh, and my concern is not as much with the safety of the technology, because I believe that will get figured out, but my concern is what, what are the larger impacts going to be on society? What are the cascading effects of this new technology? So one of the questions I get all the time when I talk about this emerging technology, autonomous vehicles, is when is this going to happen? And it's really helpful to look at a, a chart like this, which shows how quickly we assimilate, we, we take on new technologies when they hit us. So on the bottom axis here is time, and on the side axis is the percentage of people who've adopted the new, uh, new technology. And what you can see from this is, as we get closer and closer to today, the lines get steeper and steeper. We take in, we adopt these technologies much faster. So whereas it took the telephone about 100 years to get to 95% adoption, it took the cell phone 10. So the moral of the story is, in our society today, when we have a new technology, we take it on very quickly. So where are we with this new technology, autonomous vehicles? In this ancient history of August 2016, um, the first autonomous vehicle that anyone could ride in arrived in our country. Uh, in Pittsburgh, Uber started to have uh, cars that you could call up on your phone, and just get in, and it'll be driven around by someone. This is what's called level three automation. And what that means is that there's someone behind the front seat, but they don't touch the wheel unless the car tells them there's a problem. Okay? That was in August of 2016, revolution. When I first heard this, I thought, oh my goodness, what's happening? Later that year in October, we had the first autonomous freight delivery. It was beer <laughs> in Colorado uh, that was getting delivered from the brewery to a, a distribution center. Uh, and that was also this huge revolution. In June of last summer, or, or sorry, June of 2017, last summer, 10 of the top 11 car manufacturers in the world said that they would have AVs to market by 2021. That is very soon. And at the time, when I first saw that, I thought, this is a little bit of hubris. I don't know if they're really going to get there. In November of 2017, Waymo, which is Google's autonomous vehicle arm, announced that in Arizona, in the Phoenix area, 
they were starting to run what's called level four automation. And what that is, is it's a car with nobody in the front seat. So they're running them as trials, but this was actually happening in Phoenix. In January of this year, GM announced that they put in for permit, federal permit, to build cars that do not have steering wheels or pedals. Level four automation. That same month, that same month, Waymo announced that they were purchasing 20,000 of their vans. In May of this year, Waymo announced that they were going to have, by the end of this year, level four automation, Uber and Lyft type services where you could call them up and get in in the Phoenix area by the end of this year. So by the end of this year, any of us could go to the Phoenix area, call up a Waymo car, and it will come up with no one in it. Three weeks ago, Waymo announced that they were purchasing 62,000 vans. So it's going to be deployed. We don't know where, they announced which cities, but it's going to be deployed all over the country very soon. This is happening. This is real. This is not science fiction, it's science fact. And it became much more real to me two weeks ago uh, when I was at Mountain View with a colleague of mine at Waymo, and we got to ride in one of their autonomous vehicles. And it is shocking to be in these cars. I, had, I was sitting behind the driver's seat, and I had to keep on looking over and, and making sure that the driver really wasn't holding onto the steering wheel because it felt just like that. And we, you know, we got cut off, and we had to deal with pedestrians and cyclists, and it felt like someone was driving. The technology is really advanced. A question then is, what's this mean for our cities? The technology is arriving. We know that once it really gets here, we're going to adopt it really quickly. What does that mean for the way that we live? So let me, let me give you an example. How many of you have one of these? Yes, right? And what is it doing right now? Parked, right? So it turns out that our cars are parked 95% of the time. Yeah, most of the time, we are not using our cars that's sitting around parked. And that's your car. But when we have a whole lot of yours, we have this thing called parking. And there's a whole lot of, this, of, a lot of it in this country. There's about somewhere between one and two billion parking spots in the country. That's between four and eight parking spots per car that exists in the country. It is a tremendous amount of, of space. Um, but it turns out, we might not really need all that parking. So um, I like to think of Uber and Lyft as autonomous vehicles that just happen to have drivers in them. And the reason I say that is that we use them the same way that we'll use autonomous vehicles. We'll call it up, it'll show up, we'll get in, it'll take us wherever we need to go, and then it'll go and pick up somebody else. That's exactly the way we'll be using our AVs. Um, with, uh, with this change in how we move, we all of a sudden need a whole lot less parking. So there's been a number of studies that show that we need something between 10, 15, 20% of the parking that exists today. Now, that on the one hand seems, okay, the parking's going away. I work in the fields of arch uh, architecture, urban design, and planning. And in our world, you might have heard the phrase, uh, form follows function. Form actually follows parking, right? <laughs> Most of what happens in the, or the way our communities develop has to do with parking. And no longer needing that changes everything. So for instance, we can build much more densely if we don't have to carry all the, all the parking along with it. Uh, projects are more feasible because we don't have to pay for all that parking that's going on. Right? Huge changes in how the downtowns can work. But that's true for suburbs as well. The suburban office park, we no longer need all that parking. That, that can now maybe move to the strip mall, which doesn't need that parking anywhere. We can put these amenities together. A complete shift of how our built environment works. Affordable housing becomes much more feasible. We don't have to have all that, buy that extra land to put that parking in, and we don't have to build parking. We don't have to carry parking. And that land that we bought, we can now put actually more units on it. So if, if housing gets more affordable. So a lot of things are going to be changed. We call these these kind of cascading effects of this new technology. But there's also some not so great potential effects. So for instance, how much parking there is in cities, all that land starts to become available. In downtown cores, this is Portland where I'm from, not a whole lot. There's not a ton of parking in most downtowns, and so you're not going to see a whole lot of effect. But when we get to the suburbs, that changes. There tends to be a lot more parking in these areas, and in some areas, even more. So this is a mall just, just south of here, right? So what happens 
when all this land becomes available in a short amount of time. If we think about the laws of supply and demand, if we're increasing supply tremendously and demand is staying more or less the same, prices will drop. Right? Uh, what happens when there's not that much demand to begin with? This is Cleveland, where there's a whole lot of parking. If there's not a lot of development pressure and we add even more land, we have even larger problems. So property values will drop. For those of us who own homes, who own property, that's a little troubling. <laughs> Um, for those of who don't, <laughs> this should be great news for you. Um, but in addition to property values going down, we also will have property taxes going down. So how is it that cities are going to continue to uh, maintain the, all their infrastructure, all the service they need, with a reduction of bu in their budgets? Let me give you another example of some of these cascading impacts. Our commute. The basic commute in this country, the average commute time, is 25 minutes. So what happens with a world of autonomous vehicles? First of all, we can go further in 25 minutes. AVs will be much more efficient than we are in driving. and can be able to go faster, and so we'll get further out. And also, instead of spending 25 minutes doing this with my hands on the wheels and my eyes on the road, I could be working on my phone, watch a movie, hang out with my kids, do exercise, eat. So I might be willing to do, instead of 25, maybe 35 minutes or 45 minutes. So the pressure to go out further is even more. So in, all I wanted in my life was to live out in the woods, or I really wanted a house with a large yard that was inexpensive. I can just drive out a little further and get those things. So the pressure on sprawl from this new technology is tremendous. Well, that has all sorts of consequences as well. The cost of infrastructure to build and maintain all these roads is much higher. Ask any mayor in the country how happy they are about having to pay for maintaining all the roads that exist right now. Uh, the consumption of habitat, the consumption of land, destruction of habitat, right, goes up even more. The cost of providing services in low-density areas is much higher than higher-density areas. And then finally, the problem I was talking about before of added land supply, well, we just multiplied that again by expanding further. So the main issue I'm trying to make here, the main point I'm trying to make, is that AVs are not a transportation issue. This huge transportation innovation of autonomous vehicles is not a transportation issue. It is an everything issue. It's going to affect all of us, and it's going to affect all of our lives. And I think there's two reasons for us to really be clear about that. One, because I think it's true and we need to be preparing for that. But two, because we need to be able to build the political will to make the changes within our cities, within our communities, that will prepare us for these changes that are coming. If this is just a conversation among people who work in the transportation field, we're lost. We need to have everyone at the table, people who are interested in housing, people who are interested in the community development, people who are interested in economic development. This is going to affect all of us. So we need to shift from this being a, from autonomous vehicles being a technical issue to it being really a community issue. To give you an example of how much we need to make that shift happen, um, imagine, think for a minute, how many engineers do you think are working on the technical aspects of autonomous vehicle? Thousands, tens of thousands, easily? How many people do you think are working on the community ramifications, on the ways our cities are going to change on this? I come from what I consider an extremely progressive city in these issues. We work a whole lot on this. I can count on one hand the number of people in Portland whose full-time job it is to work on these topics. We need to change that. We often say cities that think ahead stay ahead. We need to have foresight. We cannot let the way that the automobile first arrived in our cities and the impacts it had to happen again with autonomous vehicles, for these impacts to happen to us as opposed to us being able to con control these things and have agency in them. We need to make sure that we have a say, that we think about what's happening, that we think about how best to approach that, and that we bring everyone to the table to do that. And we really need to take control and take agency of our autonomous future. Thank you.